This is the question for today is, why does the bodily resurrection of Jesus matter? What does it mean for us in our own lives? Um, we can start the way that Paul does in this chapter and go through the facts of the resurrection, the historicity, the evidence. And Paul does a terrific job laying out all the evidence for the resurrection, the facts of the resurrection. And when you start with verse 3, he goes to say, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, so it was prophesied, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, or, or Peter, and then to the twelve. So there we have Jesus appearing to one person, appearing to twelve, and then after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep, meaning that the readers of, of 1 Corinthians could go and talk to people who saw the risen Jesus. They can actually have a conversation with those people, and they would tell them, this is what he was like, this is what he said, this is what he told us about this resurrection life. There's evidence, there's facts, there's all kinds of historic truth that Paul is presenting. And then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as, as to one abnormally born, which, which is Paul's way of saying, I don't deserve that. I did not deserve to be among those who saw Jesus and witnessed who he was. I am not deserving of that. But this, is, this was Paul laying out the evidence of the resurrection. Okay? This is Paul saying, when Jesus rose from the dead, it changed us. He took 12 people who were hiding in fear, and he turned those same people into world changers. The best evidence to explain that is that Jesus rose from the dead. That's what Paul was saying. So the evidence is there. If you looked at the church's exponential growth throughout that area of the Mediterranean throughout Europe and then the whole rest of the world, what would explain that? What is the best explanation for that to have happened? It has to be the resurrection of Jesus. So the evidence is there. There's no real viable explanation for all of this except for the fact that Jesus must have risen from the dead. This is true. This is good for our modern minds. This is good for our intellectual minds because our modern, enlightened, scientific minds are always looking for the data, right? We want the data. Give us the scientific proof. And this is, this is his way of doing that. Paul's way of saying, here's the proof. And here's the evidence. And the only explanation for it is Jesus rose from the dead. It's very simple. It's very similar to those of you in science and research, you look at the evidence and you say, there must be an atom. <laughs> no one's ever seen an atom, right? No one's ever seen an electron. No one's ever seen anything that small with the naked eye. But you can see the evidence for it. You can make conclusions based on the impact and the evidence that surrounds it and then conclude there must be an atom. There must be electrons. Those are things that Paul is saying, yes, here's all the evidence and the only explanation, Jesus rose from the dead. So that satisfies us. That gives us the facts. Now here's the problem. In today's world, facts don't always change our opinions. They should. Facts should change our opinions. Facts should change our worldview. Facts should change even how we feel. But in our world today, we start with our opinions, and then we only look for facts that reinforce our opinions. Right? This is why certain people watch certain cable news networks, because the facts that they show on those news programs affirm my opinions, affirm my worldviews. And so in our today's society, we don't let the facts just form our opinions. The facts have to conform to our opinions. And this is something that we all have to be wary of. 
Because we could lay out the facts of the resurrection all day long. Plenty of evidence for that. Read The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. He lays out all the evidence of the resurrection. But it's not enough to know the facts unless we let the facts change us. Change our beliefs, change our worldview, change our feelings, change the way that we see everything. That's what the facts need to do. And that's the question that's before us. Have we let the facts of the resurrection truly change us? Change our opinions, change our fundamental trusts, the things that we trust and depend on for how the world works. Have we let the resurrection change us to that point? So let's dive into that. What does it look like? If you believe those facts, what then does it look like when you truly believe those facts and let those facts change you? What Paul goes on to write in the, in the rest of this chapter in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, one man representing humanity rose from the dead. And we see that in verse 45, the ver very first verse that Teresa read for us. In, in chapter 15, verse 45, so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, or the second Adam, a life-giving spirit. So here Paul is talking about the first human being. Here's Adam. He came into the world. And, and it is through Adam that sin entered the world, and therefore death entered the world. So through this one human being, all of us have been stained by the same problem. The problem of sin, the problem of death, that is what he brought into all of humanity. Okay, so there's that. But then a second Adam appeared. Who's the second Adam? Jesus. Jesus, and Paul calls him this beautiful thing, a life-giving spirit. So another Adam comes. And this Adam is the one man who represents all of us. And this Adam, Jesus, is a life-giving spirit. So if we think of the cross and Jesus coming to the cross, we can look at that and say that in the darkest moments of the cross, that is God's no to the sin that entered into the world. God's no to sin. God's no to death. And he laid all of that upon Jesus. Okay? Okay. But if we look at the resurrection, that is God's yes. God's yes to humanity. God's yes to everything that he's made. God's yes that says, I love you, you matter. We're not going to let sin and death be the final word. There's a second Adam. And the second Adam is God's yes. God's yes to life. Life-giving yes is what Jesus is for us. And this is how, if we believe in the resurrection, if we believe in the facts of the resurrection, and we say, yes, I want to let the resurrection start to form my worldview and my opinions of everything, then this is where it starts to take hold. We start to say, God, I see your yes over Jesus, over me. And I say yes with you. I say yes to you, Jesus, saying yes and giving life over me. That's where it begins. Have you been able to look at Jesus and say, God, Jesus, you are God's yes over me, so therefore I receive the life that you have for me. Can you accept that? Can you say yes with God? And this is not some small thing. Because some of us, we might struggle with actually thinking, do I really matter? Am I really valuable? Am I really worth it? If we are, then we're not fully saying yes with God. God is saying yes, which means yes, you are worth it. Yes, you are valuable to me. And let me show you how. I give you the second Adam who has come to be a life-giving spirit to you. Can you say yes with God over you? That's where it begins. That's where it begins.
When you start to say yes along with God, then the power of the resurrection starts to be not just a historical event, but it starts to be this growing power in your life through the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus as a life-giving spirit is a reference to the fact that when Jesus rose from the dead, he ascended to the Father, and what did Jesus say? He said, I will send my spirit. I will send my spirit, and my spirit will come and bring life, life into your lives. This is how Jesus brings life. When we say yes, along with God, that he wants to bring life to us and reverse sin and reverse death that the first Adam brought, now his power, his resurrection power, starts to work inside my body, inside of my life. This is where the change starts to take a hold. So if we look further back, look at verse 20. Chapter 15, verse 20 says this, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So Jesus is called the first fruits. The first fruits of what? He's the first of his kind. The first of his kind. Well, where are the rest of his kind? All who believe in the resurrected Jesus, all follow. He's the first. Now notice this. He didn't become the first when he came into this world. That's not when he became the first fruits. He became the first fruits when he rose from the dead. Because when he rose from the dead, he took on a new kind of body, a new quality of life. And now this quality of life that we see in this new body Jesus has is the first model. It's the first of its kind, meaning that this is now the new life that we inherit through Jesus. If you think about Jesus's life, we have a picture of it after he rose from the dead of what his life looked like when on the earth, right? Remember, when he appeared to the disciples, his body was able to walk through a wall. Okay, that's different. That's new, right? Okay, what else? Well, he had breakfast, right? Remember, he could eat, which means he still had a stomach, he had a digestive system. So that stays, right? So there's some, some things that are original, some things that are new, these new qualities. We have no idea just how many new things we are going to be able to inherit through Jesus in his new body. But it's going to be awesome. <laughs> it's going to be new. And it's going to be resurrected power kind of new. It's not the kind of thing that you can go read a self-help book and say, hey, I want to grow. <laughs> I want to learn how to walk through a wall. How can I do that? None of that is anything that you can do on your own. It only comes through the power of the resurrected Jesus. So what happened to Jesus when he was raised from the dead? is one thing in history. But what happened in Jesus is what will happen in you. That's the new life that we start to assume now. We start to live in. And this is what the resurrection is supposed to do. It's supposed to bring this new quality of life into our lives and into our bodies. So now we bear this new quality of life within us. More on this. Look down back to verse 47. The, force, the first man was of the dust of the earth. That's Adam. The second man, Jesus, is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. As is the heavenly man, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. You see this? Those who are now in Christ, the resurrected Christ, through faith, now bear the image of this heavenly man, the first fruits quality, that everlasting life quality, the power of the resurrection quality. That's now in us. It's now in us. You get that? So the resurrection isn't something that just happened to Jesus. It's something that happened in Jesus. And if it happened in Jesus, it's happening in you. It's happening in you right now as you believe in Jesus. 
And so where does this new life come to full fruition? Because we know. Have you, anyone tried walking through a wall lately? No. Okay, that's good. That's good. Don't try this at home because it's not come to full fruition quite yet. But we do have evidences of it. And if you look at Romans 6.4, it gives us a little indication of that. Romans 6.4 says, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So there's something that's happened within us. We've become new creations. We've become part of the new model, this first fruit quality of life. It's now in us. And Paul says, you can start living that out now. And how does he go on saying that? You can do that through the power of his spirit. The life-giving spirit of Jesus is now at work in you, has made you now alive to God, and now you can start to live a life that looks like Jesus. Whoa. Okay? Are you tracking with me? Are you? Because if you're not, then... At some point, you're, you're, you've got to ask yourself at some point, am I really letting the facts shape my opinions here? Right? Because right now, some of you are thinking, huh, live and love like Jesus? I know me. My wife knows me. Uh, my kids know me. Everyone knows me. I have really fallen short. I have not measured up. Right? And this is where you have to go, wait, 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 wait. But the facts of the resurrection tell me that there is this new life-giving spirit, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, has now made me alive unto God, so now I have this new capacity. It's not because of what I've done to work on myself. It's only because I am willing to work with the spirit of God who is wanting to produce this new life in me. And now in cooperation with him, oh, I can live a, pow a powerful, resurrected life in the power of the Spirit. Okay? So facts and opinions. Who's winning right now? Who's winning in your paradigm? Facts and opinions. Let the facts rule here. So what happens in the fru full fruition? What is this going to look like when this new quality of life starts to unfold in your life? What is it? What's the end look like? So then you go all the way down to verse 50. And Paul says, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So he's saying, if you don't have that life-giving spirit of God that makes you into a new, new humanity, you can't enter the kingdom of God. Flesh and blood, that's not enough. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep but we will all be changed in a flash in the twinkle of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will ra be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. That's the end of the story. You are going to be fully clothed in this new resurrection body that will be fitting for eternal life with God. Is that true? Is this true? The story of Jesus needs to be your story now. The story of Jesus is the story of our salvation. The new body of Jesus is now your body, to a point. But it will be fully your body at the end of the story. So, what difference does this make in how you live? If you look at the early church, if you look at Paul, you start to see, oh, this is someone who lived in the reality of the resurrection. For example, he talks about it uh, in verse 30. He says in verse 30, And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I face death every day. Yes, just as surely as I boast about you in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained? What is, what is Paul saying? I know the end of the story. Death is not the final word on me. 
Death is just this little, Pastor Dave on the mountain today, he said it, it's just a little sleep. It's a little sleep that brings us into the full reality of eternal life with him. So if that's true, if at the end of my story, that death is just a little sleep, then I don't have to fear death. I can take the risks. Paul says, I take risks. I face death all day long. Why do I do this? Because I know that death does not have the final word. Death does not have the final word. And that's why he says at the end of, of chapter 15, he says, verse, man, I need glasses. See, I cannot wait for the new body, right? I, <laughs> The new body is going to be so helpful. 54, when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. We ate breakfast this morning. You swallowed a lot of things this morning if you were here. And when you swallowed it, it was gone. I mean, you might be feeling it. But you, that's the picture. Death is swallowed up in victory. It's, it's not here anymore. It's gone. The sting. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? You hear Paul? He doesn't do this a lot, but his tone is kind of mocking, isn't it? You hear it? He's kind of looking death and saying, death, you think you're a big bully. You think you've got... All this talk, where's your sting? Where is your sting? I love this because the resurrection is actually giving you room to be funny. To laugh. You can look at death and say, huh, that's funny. That's funny. You with all your talk, you with all your threats, you thinking that you are going to have the last word. Ha! I know who has the last word. And therefore, I can risk it. I can risk it. I can risk it. I can do things that allow me to even face death. Now, we may not go through the things, I fought wild beasts in Ephesus. Anybody? Nobody? Fight any wild beasts? No. But... Some of us, we've gotten diagnoses for cancer, right? We've gotten terrible news about our jobs. We've gotten all kinds of bad news. We've received it. Wouldn't you like to re receive that news the way that Paul did? Facing death all day, but not afraid. This is what happens when the resurrection starts to take a hold in you. You realize the end of your narrative is the same as the end of Jesus' narrative. Same story. Same ending. Death is just a little sleep. Right? Other things that impact the way that we live, if you realize the end of the story is when all people from every tribe, language, people group, they're all going to be there before the throne of the Lamb and say, worthy is the Lamb. This is what the early church really believed. They knew that death didn't have its last word, and at the other side of death, we were all going to be together. People of every tribe, together. One community, one voice, one Lord. And the early church didn't just tend to its own people. Um, it, it's noted that when plagues and disease would come in the areas of the early church during that time, the early church was known at the time as the people who would reach out to all different ethnicities, all different people groups, people who were Jews, Gentiles, all the like. They would reach out and care for them. When the people, when Rome itself would depart and leave the city because of disease, Christians would stay. Christians would stay. Why? Because all people are valuable. All people had received God's yes over them because of the resurrection. And death was not the last word. So they could stay with people. Even in the threat of disease and illness, they could stay. You see the difference now? 
When you truly are saying, yes, Jesus' story is my story, it makes a whole difference in how you live. The people you hang with, the people you love, you don't fear death itself because you realize there's a new narrative. I'm going to take on an imperishable quality of life at the end of that little nap and we will all be together in the throne room of God feasting before him and God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. There will be no more sorrow, no more sin, no more tribalism, no more polarization, no more division. We will all be one people doing the thing that we were made to do, which is to worship our loving God. That's when the resurrection takes a hold in your life. So every day, we live in this narrative of death and resurrection because that's the narrative of Jesus, death and resurrection. Every day, there's something that can die in us in order for resurrection to take a hold. That's what every day looks like. When we read the scriptures, when we love our neighbor, something needs to die in order to live, right? So the question for us then is, what needs to die? in us so that resurrection life can start to emerge in us and I would say for us a lot of us what needs to die is the no that is over your life the no that comes from maybe other people who've said no you're, you don't amount to anything or no you're not worthy or no you're not valuable enough or no you, you don't measure up no you, that needs to die that needs to die in light of the resurrection. Because you cannot in good faith look at the resurrection, the empty grave, and say no over your life. Because God said yes. God said yes over your life. So that needs to die in order for that yes to come to life. The other, the other things, what, what is it that you do that is just because you fear death? What are the things, what are the worries that you have in your life that are there because you fear death? What are the fears that you're living with because you fear death? That needs to die. That needs to die. Some of us have, have become very good at accommodating fear and accommodating anxiety and worry and even accommodating depression in our lives because we just think, well, it's just life. Go to the empty tomb. Say no to that. Let it die. Let it die so that new life can come. Don't accommodate the things that Jesus came to destroy. Don't accommodate it in your life anymore. Say no to it. Let it die so that new life can start to emerge. What needs to die in order for resurrection life to take hold in you? Because that's what Jesus came to do. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and life abundant, life to its full. That is not just waiting for you to die and enter into heaven. That is not for that. It is now. The quality of life, eternal life, is now. It starts with you saying yes over Jesus and his resurrection and his empty tomb. Because if you say yes to him, you're saying yes to his yes over you. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that we share in your story. This story of death and resurrection is a new narrative now because of your resurrection from the dead. And Lord Jesus, we pray that your spirit would show us the things that need to die, the lies we believe that need to die, the messages we've believed about ourselves that need to die, the fears that need to die, the anxieties that need to die, the worries that need to die, the way we relate with other people, the ways we, we hurt each other, the ways we protect ourselves, that just need to 
die so that new resurrected life can start to emerge out of our lives. And we can then start to live and love like Jesus. Holy Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead, speak to us. Bring life into us and through us. Even now, in these moments, we welcome you, Spirit, to do that. We pray this in Jesus, your name. Amen. Amen.